Good evening, Ms. Thompson. Let it be known that Mrs. Thompson is almost on time tonight. <laughs> Jesus might be coming back. I don't know. That's, you know, it could be. That could be one of the. I think that was one of the signs. The lightning comes from the east to the west. Gabriel blows his horn, and Debbie Thompson's on time. No, I think it's Debbie Thompson's early. That's what it was. Uh huh. I read the identical Oh, did you? What do you think of it? Wasn't that a good paper? You know, the biggest thing I got out of it, though, is now I know what Gordon Green was about. <laughs> the Denethor paper. What'd you think? I read it also, but I wonder, I thought I read the paragraph where it was talking about typical race theory and everything else. Mm-hmm. I like that paragraph. Yeah, it's a brilliant paper. Uh, and he's a brilliant guy. I'm going to use it. We are... Uh, no, no, we don't have to have it. It's just a reference, you know. Um, this is, it was you know, I, I, no, I copied it out of a book that I have. Um, I probably copied it illegally. No, I didn't. No, it's, it's a book that you, that I have that you can, you can photocopy for the church and use for Bible studies and stuff. Um, no, this guy, uh, that wrote it, uh, uh, Pastor Chris Esgett is, uh, a pastor of a larger, a eh, little bit bigger than us church in, uh, in Virginia, and um, super smart guy, uh, and he wrote, and, he, and he's conservative, uh, and he, I mean, even in, by Missouri standards, he's conservative, uh, and so he, uh, he wrote this paper, uh, which I think is just one of the more brilliant things I've, I've seen, and the reason it came to my attention is because he's uh, getting quite a bit of pushback on it from, uh, from the more um, moderate, let's, let's call them moderate, uh, moderate element in the parish because uh, the, in the church, because particularly they don't like the fact that he says um, that that we're we're failing in some areas. Uh, you know, pe sometimes people just don't like hearing that uh, that in the areas in the certain areas that we're failing in as a church. Um, and 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 his you know if you read the paper, uh, you'll see that he says. Rather than chasing after, you know, the magical cures, uh, Missouri needs to go back to her roots. Mm -hmm. Now, he would say, not everybody agree with this, but he would say Lutheran schools mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah. Uh, that, that, was, that that was where children learned their catechism and learned their hymnal and learned the hymns and the word and the sacrament. Like I said, I know some people would firmly disagree with that, uh, but I think that the reality is, is that for many years in, the, in Missouri, we never had to really do much education of children because they all came through Lutheran schools yeah. and we got real lazy uh, about uh, teaching in the home. And now we have generations of kids who they didn't go through Lutheran school. They don't know any of this stuff. They don't. And, and what's more, because they they were it was never taught to them as being something important. They don't care. But their parents don't know either. Right. Well, well, I think we're we're a couple we're a couple generations out now. Yeah. You know. But you know, my generation by and large was not a Lutheran school generation. You know, there were you you there were some kids when I went to college. There were probably about half the kids there at the Lutheran college who went to Lutheran schools, and about half who didn't. Okay, but then the next generation it gets even smaller. You know, the next generation gets even smaller to, because uh, the reality is, I mean, even when in in our own in our own life, mine and Danya's, you know, when we moved here, um, the Lutheran schools could not provide uh, the kind of help that Neil needed in education. They couldn't. They said they could, and then they didn't. And didn't bother telling us <laughs> for about six months that they weren't, and uh, so we moved our kids into public schools. Uh, that we did that because of uh, they could provide um, special education, and and it was a uh, phenomenal thing that we did. And Neil thrived. But um, the the, uh, the 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 frustrating thing about it is that. Um, even if he hadn't had uh, needs that took him out, I was spending 
uh, at that time, this was back in 2004, $5,500 a year for each kid for tuition, a little over 5000 a year in taxes, in property taxes that primarily go to provide for schools, and I was having to spend another 4000 or $5,000 a year uh, at Huntington to get him special help. Well, most parents simply can't afford 20000 a year for, for uh, primary education. I mean, that's college. You know, that's college, unless you want to shoot the college fund on, or whatever on, uh, on primary education. So that's just a reality that Lutheran schools have got to face. And we've got to, st if we want Lutheran schools to exist, we have to quit uh, doing one of two things. For many, many years, we balanced the budget on the backs of the teachers. And the teachers made practically nothing, and uh, we were all okay with that. You know, by we, I mean the church, you know. That's fine, you know, teachers don't need any money. Um, you know, they can eat Wonder Bread and peanut butter. Uh, and go, go to the food bank if you need to. And then finally, teachers got uh, to the point where they said, no, uh, we can go teach in the public school and make five times what you're offering. You know, we, we would do it for three times, but not for five times less. And uh, so then we started, when we had to start paying teachers, uh, then we started digging the parents. Well, tuition went up and up and up and up and up and up. And then there became the big fight in the 80s and 90s of, uh, well, I have my children, I pay tuition at the school, so I don't have to give an offering. There was that mentality. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, that's a goods and service that you are purchasing. <laughs> the offering is something different, you know. And then so then what we would do is we would lower the tuition for parents who are members of the church because, well, they gave offerings. And so if I'm, you know, well, I was. I'm a pastor at another church. I'm paying full tuition for my kids at this Lutheran school because because they're, it's not my church. And I'm okay with that because I'm saying, nope, this is what it costs. But why does the peop, the parent who is a member at that church and doesn't do anything beyond bring their kid to church and does not give much of an offering, if any offering, they get a $2,000 a year cut in tuition. So you, you see how it's frustrating to everybody, you know. Right. Yeah. It was, it was always this. Also. This. So then everybody else has to carry the burden of the ones who got the first. So here's here's what I said down when I was in Louisville, is I said they, they kept on telling me the school's a mission, the school's a mission, the school's a mission, and I agree. The school was a, what, what was our best mission. Uh, it was our only mission because if you have a school, one of the things that you learn as a school pastor is don't try to do anything else. That was one of the reasons I was excited about the call to Trinity is because you didn't have a school. Uh, and I was, I had spent my whole ministry, 15 years, I had spent my whole ministry with a school. Well, you can't do anything else. That's it. Trinity's building in 65 was built so that it, the rooms would be too small. I know. My uh, grandpa told me that. Yeah, Bill Hughes was a genius. <laughs> he is a genius. Because he thought, and I agree with him, we have a good Lutheran school in Elmhurst, a good Lutheran school uh, just down the street in York Center, a good Lutheran school in Lombard. We don't need another Lutheran school in Villa Park. You know, and frankly, uh, Trinity Lombard has always worked with us to give, a, give our people better tuition than, I think they don't get the, they don't necessarily get the Trinity member tuition, but they get better tuition than just somebody off the streets. So they've always, they've always courted our people to have their kids over there. The Gaglianos were very happy with the education that uh, that they got over there. So the point is, is in, in Louisville, they were the school's admission, the school's admission, I agree. So people who are not Christian should get free education here. Yeah, that's exactly what I heard too. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> and everybody's shoes became really interesting. Because if you are serious about this being a mission, then you need to get rid of tuition. Right? And you need to figure out a different way to fund Lutheran education. And this is the reality uh, that we that I think Lutheran education has got to face. We have to find a third source income for Lutheran education. It cannot be ba balanced on the backs of teachers. It cannot be balanced on the backs of parents. It, it doesn't work. 
So you have to find third source funding, which is very, very doable, but you have to work at doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I'm, I'm, with that being said, you know, since we we'll read this paper, which is interesting, and I won't go with a lot of people, but it's like with this pandemic and everything, it's kind of got a silver lining here because it's forcing parents now, you, you see it happening and when you read the uh, percentages, uh -huh. that they're pulling their kids out of school and they're either homeschooling them or they're sending them to parochial schools. Mm -hmm. right. And to send them to parochial schools is like sending their kids on a platter. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. Because we have an opportunity here. He said that many times those kids come home and mommy, daddy, I want to go to church. They know the teachers. They know their friends are there. Right. And these people are joining churches. Right. Because of sometimes, it. yeah. Sometimes, yeah. 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 You know, it's an opportunity here that we need to take advantage of. You know? Do churches that don't have school somehow support churches that do? Can they? Yeah, help? yeah, sure. Here's um, here's an idea that 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 I have. I think that homeschooling is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because I think there's I hear parents all the time talking about un, uh, d being unhappy with the way the public schools are going, particularly with this critical race theory yeah. that's now being rammed down our children's throats. Yeah. Um, yeah, LGBTQT plus, you know, all that kind of stuff is being. I don't know how badly. I don't know how bad it is out here in the burbs yet. It's out here. I know it's really bad in the city. Yeah, because I gave you that uh, flyer from the Goodman. Yeah, so right. The, the Satanism plus. Right, you got the Satanism. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. I've I've been thinking of. What could we do here? We're not, we don't want to have a school. We've never had any aspirations of having a school. But what could we do here to support homeschool families? Would there be something we could do to bring them together to allow them to have a social network and make this a hub for the Villa Park homeschool families? I think it'd be really cool. I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly what that looks like. And it would take someone besides me to, to kind of do the research and figure it out. Yeah, if we only had a we got a mom's group for it now, that kind of could be a basis for something right. like that. That's what I'm, yeah, we, we do, we have the, yeah. So I think that might, that could be some place where we're, we need to go. We need to think about going, is into forming homeschool support. Because it's going to, they, they need it. You know, there, there are a lot of parents who are going to homeschool their kids over the, as, assuming the, the public schools continue going the direction they're going. A lot of parents are going to say, mm-mm. Oh, I can't afford private school tuition. Um, one of us can stay home and homeschool cheaper than we can afford daycare. And yeah. I mean, you know what daycare costs now? I have no idea. Oh, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. Some parents are spending upwards of 2000 a month if they have two kids in daycare. You know, I mean, think of what you have to make yeah. in order to offset that, to make it worthwhile. We have a bunch of defunct music school workers. Yeah. And an office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, we have space is never our issue. Um, it's but but uh, what the, the what's what's the diff, what the difficulty will be is staffing. We we what we need is a a person who who for whom this is their passion. You know to take on and become the home homeschool coordinator or whatever, and we figure that out and and all that. But I think that's you know that's looking forward to where we need to be. Uh, I think that's the niche. Of course, I could be wrong. I was I thought the music school was going to be yeah. a yeah. great niche that yeah. we could fulfill, but it didn't. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're standing at the gate and the Lord says, no. Well, the biggest thing, though, like with the music school and could be with this idea is to make sure that whoever's in charge of it stays connected to the church. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, that was like a right. huge problem with the music school right. is that they were... Just like the boxing club, occupying space in the mm -hmm. building with no connection to the church. Right. Mm -hmm. They came in and out the door. And that wasn't the plan. That wasn't how it started, right. but it was how it ended up. Yeah. yeah. If nothing else, if you needed at least an overseer that was connected to the Correct. Time, at least, you know, between, between Correct. Yeah, yeah we, have to, we have to be more intentional about that right. with anything right. else we do of have, saying. Just like at a regular Lutheran school, have chapel and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. 
Well, see, that's, I mean, what would we do for homeschool kids? Well, we could certainly have, there could certainly be activities of, of you know, social activities. There also could be chapel, at least weekly. Yeah. You, the kids could come here for chapel, you know, during the week. I mean, we could do, we have the puppet theater. We have, Mary loves working with kids with music. So they don't yeah. necessarily have to come here for their schooling, but they could come here for chapel right. and for because one of the challenges that homeschool parents face is having their kids involved with other kids in something besides community sports. I mean, they get it in, in rec league sports, but then sometimes that's all they get is rec league. And if, your kid, if you happen to have a kid who, like you know, my mother did, who's kind of awkward and fat, you know, and not very good at sports, what do you do with him? Well, we do have you know. a space where they could have gym class. So yeah, we do. Things that would be... mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so back to Denethor, uh, the, the, the Denethor paper is that, you know, Pastor Esgit makes the point that we, we, because of the, I think he would say, the collapse of the Lutheran education system, uh, which is not collapsed all in his place. He's, he's got a very, uh, what's called traditional, what is it called? Traditional education. It's sort of like the old Latin schools. You know, that's their model. Um, but because of that, um, we have people who are grasping at straws and trying, well, let's try this or let's try that. Uh, let's get this three ring binder, that three ring binder, and let's not worry about theology. Let's just worry about what gets people in the, in the building. Okay. And, and, and he likens that to Denethor, who instead of doing what he was told to do, he was the steward of the kingdom until the king returned, uh, decided to do it his way. Yeah, and we are the steward of the kingdom until the king returns. He told us, go you therefore make disciples of all nations. How? How are we supposed to do that? Yeah, baptizing and teaching. Yeah, yeah, that's how we're supposed to do it. Baptizing and teaching. He didn't say anything about any of the other kind of nonsense that we do. Uh, it's baptizing and teaching. If you're not, if, it, if whatever you're doing doesn't relate somehow to baptizing and teaching, it probably doesn't need to be done. It doesn't mean it's bad. I don't mean it. I don't mean to say that it's bad. You know, if you're if you're having a um, you know skating party and a, a, for the youth, that doesn't make it doesn't mean it's bad to have a skating party. It simply means you need to evaluate that and say how much resource are we putting into into social time for these kids instead of Bible study. You know, what's more important? What's our job? You know, our job as the church, but Jesus did not say, go ye there from the of all nations, baptizing, teaching, and having parties. You know, he, that's not what he said. So if it's not funneling somehow into baptizing and teaching, then it needs to. And sometimes you can figure out creative ways to make skating parties funnel in to baptizing and teaching. You know, we, don't, we, we pretty much don't do anything here with the kids that doesn't include some kind of devotional, I don't think we do anything. I, we do trip days in the summer, just social. Yeah, that's trip days during the summer. Yeah, yeah tend to be. The whole point of that is just to stay connected to the kids the summer. During the summer. But we could include something. Yeah, and, and we, we try to have some kind of devotion, some kind of Bible study every time they're together. Uh, even if it's real light, like Friday night was a real light Bible study. It wasn't anything heavy. I knew there were going to be kids there who, who had no connection to the church. And so it was just kind of a fun look up stuff and see weird stuff in the Bible. You know, the oldest person in the Bible who had, you know, uh, 12 toes and 12 fingers and stuff like that. that I think, you know, one of the things that I, I remember reading in there is what you can't let happen is you can't let the, the people who are in charge, you know, the, the leaders, the pastors, the mm-hmm. people who are the head stewards and stuff like that, he says they have a tendency after a while to put a, a, a suit and a tie on and come into their office all day and they forget the fact that they're an ordained pastor. Right. And they need to be doing what an ordained pastor does. Right. Is get out and preach. Right. You know, or right. teach. You know. And yep. sitting around in your sprinkled sweater. Yeah, yeah. So it's well, okay to do some of these other things. They, they, they need to be done, but don't forget what, you're, what you need to do, too. I always tell this story to, I tell it to the to pastors all the time. One day I was out, uh, I had a, uh, 
at coffee with a prospective member at 10 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, I had a hospital call. At 12 o'clock, I had another hospital call at a different hospital on far away. Uh, at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock, I had homebound visits. At 3 o'clock, I finally got here. Okay, it was my first time to actually walk in the building that day. And, I, and, and Bishop Telco happened to be holding court. It was one of his rare days of being there past noon. He hardly ever was there past noon. I don't know why he was here. I don't remember anymore. But he was holding court in the office, and he was reading something. And, uh, and I walked in. I said, oh, look, it's 3 o'clock, and I finally got to work. And he said, oh, no. He said, you've, you've been doing you, the work. Now all you have to do is tie up some loose administrivia that needs to be done. But your real work is what you've been doing. Uh, and I always appreciate that because it reminds me, even though sometimes it's very frustrating, uh, you know, when you have piles of stuff to get done on your desk and you're standing in hospital rooms and listening to stories about the gallbladder surgery and things like that, you know, sometimes you, you want to say, oh man, I really need to get to work. And pastors have to remind themselves, no, what's important is what you're doing here. The administrivia, if it never gets done, oh well. And anybody who anybody who's in leadership around here knows that administration is not my forte. You know, and I don't I don't claim that it is, and I don't try to make it. You know, I it gets done. I depend on the lay people to take care of a lot of that, and I depend on Margaret to take care of a lot of that uh, because I don't devote a huge amount of time to administrivia. I do I devote a huge amount of time to preaching, teaching, and calls. That's where I try to put the lion's share of my week. And I think that's where I think that's where pastors should put the lion's share of their week. Obviously, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it should be that way. Uh, but it's easy. You're absolutely right. It's, it's very easy to become a CEO. You know, well, put, you're the, bishop, uh, the Bishop of the English District. Hardy. 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 Still a member of his church, mm -hmm. right? He's a yeah. sociopath pastor, yeah. I didn't know this until I read that paper that he could hear us. Mm -hmm. he's an yeah, yeah, he's an associate pastor and assistant pastor, something like that, at Village Ledoux in uh, St. Louis. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. he stays active. But Hardy was one of the first who started this role. Now they're jumping on the bandwagon left and right. But at the time, when he became, when he was elected, he said, "I am not leaving the parish," and he got so much pushback. So many people criticized him for doing that. And then Harrison took a call to be an associate pastor or an assistant pastor or something. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Now, to his credit, David Banky in the Atlantic District uh, was the first one that I ever heard of. He never left it. Now, the Atlantic District is a very small district. So it's, it's more reasonable when you have 60 parishes, 50, 60 parishes, it's more reasonable that you can be a full-time parish pastor and be the, the bishop of the district. When you have 165, and of course the Atlantic District, the other thing is, is everything's within three blocks. You know, I mean, you know, it's New York City. So, you know, every, the, the district is very, very tight and compact compared to the English District, which covers 22 states in Canada. So it's a hard job for, for our Bishop Hardy to remain in the parish, but he does it. And then... Uh, his senior pastor went down with COVID over Christmas. And so on top of everything else, Bishop Hardy had to do all the Christmas services. And he was complaining about that in Florida. And those of us who are full-time parish pastors went, oh, our heart's just bleeding over here. Stop. You know, the other one that, that got me to, the other point that he made uh, was, like Hardy or Harrison or whatever, those people cannot stop visiting their congregations. Right. They got to get out and visit. Right. Them. And that's where the biggest pushback is coming from, is district presidents who are angry that he indicted them. Now, to which Bishop Hardy, now Bishop Hardy is, is past, it's kind of one of those weird things. Like, I'm Tony Oliphant from Redeemer, Pastor Oliphant. I'm, I'm his boss because he's a circuit visitor. I'm the vice president. But he's a circuit visitor of the, circuit, the parish I serve, so he's my boss too. You know, see how that works? It's weird. It depends on what role we're in as to who's, who's, who's the boss. Well, Pastor Esgut is a vice president of the Missouri Synod, so he's Bishop Hardy's boss, but Bishop Hardy is the bishop of the district in which he serves. <laughs> yeah. 
So Bishop Hardy is his ecclesiastical supervisor. So if anything's going to be done about this, it has to come from Bishop Hardy. Well, you can guess it's not going to come from Bishop Hardy. And so there's, there's some other district presidents who are very upset because they feel like they were really maligned in that paper. And Bishop Hardy said, well, if you're doing your job, you shouldn't feel bad. You know, if, if you're making the calls, if you're making the visits, every, I can't say that for sure, almost every congregation in the English district has received a visit in the last three years from either Bishop or one of his representatives, which one of his assistants or one of his vice presidents. We've seen, as far as I know, we've seen almost every congregation. We've been physically in those congregations. He, he takes visitation very seriously. And, when, and we receive, the district receives an evaluation from, from Bishop Harrison. So once during every three years, every triennium, the, the suits from St. Louis come into our board meeting and review us okay, uh, as to how we're doing as a district. Um, and we get really good reviews because the district is doing really well but he's especially complimentary of Bishop Hardy's visitation. Uh, that how many parishes he gets into every, I mean, he's got, he gets so many, he gets into so many parishes that on his points, on his Delta card, he and his wife flew to London for dinner one night because <laughs> they had to use them or he was going to lose them. So he says, Wendy, we're going to dinner in London. <laughs> Right, right, from coast to coast, from Canada to Florida, yeah. from Naples, Florida to Toronto, from uh, um, New Jersey, uh, it's our far, I think our farthest east, I think, yeah. maybe, oh, yeah. yeah, we've got, we've got, we've got two, two parishes in Alaska that are talking to us. He's, no, he's in, in uh, Michigan now, he's in Detroit, he bought a place up in near Detroit. Is yeah. there any other church body that's organized? I don't know the word you use it. Um, I mean, you're talking about how everybody's covering each other. Yeah. And the support. When I first came here, I felt that without really knowing. You can just research them. Yeah, it's just there. Like, there is support for. He, he talked about that a little, little bit. He just had a different point. We are pretty organized compared to others, like especially the non-denominational ones and stuff like that. It's, it's, yeah, no, kind of cool. No yeah. Like checks and balances, but support and people to back you up and make sure you're okay. Any parishes in Hawaii, Sarah wants to know. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. When are we going to the Philippines? Yeah, not yet. Uh, yeah, the Romans. The Roman system is similar to our system. Uh, they're divided into the Roman Roman. It, it, they're divided into dioceses. The ELCA is divided into. They call it synods. Um, yeah, they Yeah, that, that's the. I would say the liturgical church bodies. Uh, it's very common to be in this kind of system. Uh, Methodists used to be highly organized. I don't know if they. I, I don't, I don't know any Methodist pastors anymore because uh, the last one I knew was Chuck Emery over at Calvary and he's been retired a long time now. Um, so they used to be highly organized, but I, I kind of get the impression that that was sort of falling apart. Uh, Presbyterian USA used to be highly organized uh, and I think they probably still are. Um, but uh, yeah, but the, the non-denominational churches are not affiliated. So with anything. So yeah, so there's no organization there, then there's no oversight, which is the real problem. I mean, if, if in the Missouri Senate, if you go off the rails uh, and, and uh, need to be brought back into line, we have a system for that, uh, to do that. Um, so, I mean, they don't because everybody's just sort of their own judge in their own land, you know. I knew as president of Central Archbishop, but I didn't know how much he 
get out to see his yeah. churches, but he was present in church all the time too. He mm-hmm. was present in preaching and, and our Bible class and everything else. So he did both. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible, especially with Central Illinois, it's a very tight district. You know, you really, you, you, it's a very small geographical area, and all your parishes are really located in clumps. You know, you got Quad Cities, Peoria, Springfield, you know, <laughs> it's it's Decatur. Decatur yeah. Yeah, Southern Illinois starts. Southern Illinois starts at south of Quincy. I think Quincy is Central Illinois. And then Southern Illinois picks up after that, and then all the way down. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I think it's a great paper. Has nothing to do with Hosea, uh, but you know, here we are, half an hour into the class, and we're actually going to start on the subject matter. All right. <laughs> all right we're going. We are in Second Kings, talking about the kings that uh, reigned during the time of Hosea to kind of give us the historical background. Uh, 2 Kings 15, verse 32 is where we stopped last week. 2 Kings, I think, 15, verse 32. 2 Kings, right. So last week, uh, we finished up the reign of Uzziah. Um, he, and he died, uh, the, and Jotham, his son, took over. In the second year of Pekah, this is northern kingdom, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Well, there's a change for you, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offering on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria. Okay, now that's further north. Syria is north of Israel. Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, that's the king of Israel, they made, a, they made an alliance against Judah. Okay, now see, that's a bad thing. Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. We've, you've heard of Ahaz because he reigned for quite a while and he was at a very significant time. In the seventeenth year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. So what's worse, having a seventy-four-year-old president or a twenty-year-old king? (laughs) Every time you complain about how old the president is, think about, would you like a twenty-year-old king? Would that be something you'd enjoy? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was, they, they had. Yeah, but then they had consorts who actually ran things. This is this guy's actually running things at twenty. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Child sacrifice. It was a common thing uh, to the people who the Lord had driven out, and uh, apparently uh, Ahaz thought it'd be a good thing to give give a run at. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to wage war in Jerusalem, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. At that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, recovered Elath for Syria and drove the men of Judah from Elath, and the Edomites came uh, to Elath, where they dwell to this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. 
Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. Ahaz also took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it, carrying its people captive to Kerr, and he killed Rezin. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, he saw the altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a model of the altar and its pattern exact in all details. And Uriah the priest built the altar in accordance with all that the King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it before King Ahaz arrived from Damascus. And when the king came from Damascus, the king viewed the altar. Then the king drew near to the altar and went up on it and burned his burnt offerings and his grain offerings and poured his drink offering and threw the blood of his peace offering on the altar. And the bronze altar that was made before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between his altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of the altar and shoved it in the closet. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, on the great altar burn the morning burnt offerings and the evening grain offerings and the king's burnt offerings and his grain offerings and the burnt offering are all the people of the land and their grain offering and their drink offering and throw, it, throw on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice, but the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. Uriah the priest did all this and King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the frames of the stands and removed the basins from them. And he took down the sea from off the bronze oxen that were, uh, that were under it and put it on a stone pedestal. And the covered way for the Sabbath that had been built inside the house and the outer entrance for the king, he caused to go around the house of the Lord because, the king of, because of the king of Assyria. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaz that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. Okay, so Ahaz. You know, Ahaz is a perfect model uh, for what not to do in the church. Okay? Um, when we are threatened from outside influences, we do not turn to other outside influences to try to form alliances. We trust in, yeah, sometimes Jesus is the answer. Yeah, we trust in Jesus. We do what Jesus commands us to do and let him work out the details. It's not our problem. Okay? It's not our problem to figure out all the worldly details. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to preach and to teach his word in this world. That's all we're called to do. And, and, and the problem with the church is that she sometimes forgets that. And she sometimes begins to believe that she's another um, agency in the world like DCFS or uh, welfare or something like that, one, another agency. Or sometimes she begins to think that she's a club, you know, that of good, nice Christian people who get together and have nice, wonderful times. And uh, it's, it's easy to do. It's easy for her to forget who she is. And you see this model right here. You know, Ahaz is threatened by a uh, pe uh, uh, Pekka and uh, Rezin, who are formidable enemies. You know, this, this was not a small thing. It wasn't like, oh, come on, Ahaz. It's no big deal. It's just Syria and Israel attacking you. It is a big thing. It is a terrifying thing from a human standpoint. But we have to try our very best to separate our human emotions from reality. Okay. Reality is, God says, trust in me. Don't trust in anybody else. Don't trust in anything else. Trust in me. Do what I tell you to do and trust in me. I'll handle it. Okay. So hard to do. 
Yeah. But you're not saying that churches shouldn't try to uh, set up something to help people. I mean, keeping in mind, that, right? I mean, keeping in mind what their goal is. So if if uh, <clears throat> if the church is participating in social ministry of any kind, what's the goal? Serve people, praise God, and serve people. I guess, right? To proclaim the word. Yeah. Yep, to proclaim the word. If you tell me, well, you can uh, have a food pantry. But you can't, you can't tell the people who come here about Jesus that I'm going to say, no, that we don't need a food pantry. You know? If you tell me that you can, take, you can do service projects, but you can't pray out in public you know, when you're doing the service projects, well, then I guess we don't do the service projects. Okay? Because our first goal is whatever we do, we're proclaiming word and sacrament. Okay? That's what we're doing, first of all, as the church. Because God says, go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always. Real simple, real simple instructions. Okay? But sometimes we in the church get so caught up in the administration of whatever it is we're trying to do that we forget why we're doing it. You know, the goal of the music school was not to have lovely vocalists. It was to draw people into church, okay? to, to sing in church and to play in church. And through a series of mishaps, we completely lost that. You know, we never saw them in church. They had no intention of being in church. You know? That's why God let it go. And so God let it go. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And that's why I didn't you know, mourn and put sackcloth and ashes on us because I figured... God said, yeah, you guys screwed that up. We're going to get rid of that and move on to something else. Mm -hmm. I always think about the coloring groups. Yeah. But they do come in and pick up the Bible and read it, and the leaders talk to me about church, and mm -hmm. they never say a word if I put out Christian coloring pages or anything. Right. So it's interesting. But I... And that wasn't a ministry we were trying to start at all. That just fell in our lap. In many ways, more than just yeah. Ways. Yeah, it just happened. I think about like knitting now. It's kind of like I don't know. They knit and they give to charity, but I don't know. Sometimes I just don't feel like they. Well, you have to constantly. Be, and, and, uh, I, I always appreciated uh, Pastor David Thiel, who said, "Ride the wave." Right. You know, you always have to be conscientious of. Okay, this is accomplishing our goal, but it might not always accomplish our goal. So we might want to get off the surfboard and get a different waves at some point, you know. We don't have to float out there forever. We can say, no, nah, that was fun for a while. Let's go ride another wave. So you always have to be asking yourself, is this accomplishing the goal to proclaim God's word to people? Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, back to you, Dave, with the, with the social ministry stuff, sometimes people um, get confused about social ministry, and they say, well, we're proclaiming God's love to people. But God's love without his word is meaningless. God's, you can't separate God's love from God's word. God's word is God's love, right? And so if you, if you can't talk to people about who Jesus is, then, then you know, let them starve, because it doesn't matter. You're taking me back to that paper again, because... There was a term used several times in there. We got to quit being apologetic for who's right. Yeah, you know, right. We got to be firm about right. our, who we are, what we believe, right, and let the world know this. Right. I apologize for it. You know? Right. Yeah, uh, Pastor Esgit believes. Pastor, uh, there, there's a number of pastors that believe this very strongly. That the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is is sort of at a watershed, where we're either going to just die and fade off into nothingness or we're going to really move forward uh, we're kind of at a point here where uh, there's a lot of people in the missouri senate who are who are saying we're tired of being bashful about pure doctrine you know we're tired of being sorry that we're that we teach rightly and we're trying to be, we're, we're tired of apologizing for the other lutherans you know 
they're, they're not Lutheran. Okay, if you don't confess the the Book of Concord, that is that is the definition of Lutheran. If you teach things that are contrary to the Book of Concord, you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself, but that is the definition of Lutheran. Is the Book of Concord? That's what we say. Those are our confessions. You know, your confession is what defines you. Except in, unless you're, um, uh, what is it? Which which one is it? The Thirty Nine Articles? Is that Methodist? Anyway, we call it the 39 Suggestions, you know. Uh, I think it's Methodist, you know, where it's kind of like, well, if you want to believe this. As a, Danya was so shocked one time, she had a co-worker who, who was a, uh, uh, either a Methodist or Pres her Presbyterian, I think it was, Presbyterian, and she went to a, their convention, and uh, she came back and was telling Danya the doctrine they had voted on. <laughs> and I, what? <laughs> what do you mean you voted on doctrine? Well, whether or not we wanted to believe that or not, or whether, we, whether we're going to, you know, you know, this is this is very foreign to those of us who believe the scriptures. That you would decide, no, we're not going to believe that anymore. We're going to vote that one down. I'm sure God was very disappointed. Oh, look, they voted down. Does this start like with what they're being taught in seminaries? Like, oh, I think it starts way before that. I mean, the seminaries, the seminaries respond to what the people want. You know, seminaries are driven by by the the congregation, the the, the church body, uh, and so if the church body uh, is pushing to be more inclusive, let's say, uh, to not be don't don't be so you know, we need to be softer, we need to be softer and easier and and get along. Be more godlike. Yeah, be more godlike. Be more godly. Um, I, when people say that, by the way, I remind them of things like the Red Sea where he drowned the entire Egyptian army. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you mean by being more godly? Or when the 400 prophets of Baal were killed with uh, lightning? Is that what you mean? Yeah, right. Yeah, when he had his son crucified on, on the cross for us? Is that, was that what you're talking about? Uh, but so the seminaries are, tend to be driven in that way. Uh, Simon Samuel Schmucker was a Lutheran who came over here um, in the early 1800s before Walther, but not much before Walther, I think. Uh, anyway, he was he's sort of the father of American Lutheranism. And what his goal was is to blend the Lutherans in with everybody else. So whoever was already over here, blend them all together and create an American Christianity. That's what he wanted to do. Uh, and in, uh, uh, so, schmucker. Yeah, schmucker. Like the jelly, you know, schmucker. Yeah. And so, uh, and so in 1988, when the ELCA formed, uh, one of my history professors said, well, schmucker had his way. Uh, because it's exactly what happened is that we have, now we have the Missouri Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, well, in 1988, we had the Missouri Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, and everybody else. Okay, was into a, 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 and and very shortly they became they had they declared altar pulpit fellowship with Presbyterian USA and with United Methodists. That's exactly what Schmucker wanted. You know? now since then they've had all kinds of split offs. So now we have the uh, LCC, the Lutheran Church and Confession. We have the NALC, the National American Lutheran Church all who are split aways now of people who say, mm, particularly over the sexuality issue, the LGBTQ stuff. No, we can't go down that road any further. We've gone as far as we can go with you. And now that's why we see this huge splitting apart again of, of the Lutherans. Um, because like uh, someone said once, is that whenever you have three Lutherans in a room, you have five opinions. So... <laughs> Okay, back to 2 Kings chapter 17, the reign of Hoshea. Uh, and this was the last king uh, of the northern kingdom under which um, uh, Hosea prophesied. Uh, Ahaz was the last kingdom, king of the southern kingdom under which uh, Hosea prophesied. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, began to reign in Samaria over Israel. 
and he reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, okay? yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. This was after he was the son of Tiglath-Pileser, I believe. And Oshia became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to uh, So, king of Egypt. Aha. So let's draw somebody else in here. And offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the ha uh, Habor, the river of Goshen, and in the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations, whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in, in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in their towns from, that's altars, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked <coughs> things, provoking the Lord to anger. They served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I command your fathers that I sent to you by my servants, the, the prophets, and they would not listen, but were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false, and they followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves metal images of two calves, and they made an Asherah and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal, and they burned their sons and their daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. There's the end of Israel. Okay, the ten tribes, gone. What was the idea was to start burning your murdering? Well, that was a common practice uh, among the, the heathen of that land. Uh, child sacrifice was, was practiced by the Canaanites, uh, practiced by the Egyptians, practiced by the Assyrians. Uh, child sacrifice was common. Yeah. Just like that, the, the uh, tribes in, in Afghanistan, and they have to sell the people, their kids over to the, the nasty people. The, kids, the, the Taliban? Taliban, yeah. yeah. Taliban. And well... And let's talk about abortion. Yeah, yeah. What is that but child sacrifice? <laughs> Granted, you're not sacrificing it to an idol. You're sacrificing it to what? Soul. Convenience, money. That can be an idol. Yeah, but I mean, you're not. You're, you, you didn't build an Ashura pole in your backyard. <laughs> you know, but and see, nobody, nobody wants to talk about that. Oh, let's not talk about abortion. That's a you know that's that's a that's a very controversial topic. Well, yeah, it's wrong. Okay, it's wrong. Under any conditions, it's wrong. It's murder. Okay, if you don't like that, I'm sorry. It's, it, don't argue with me. God's the one who said it. Okay, he's the one who said it. And I used to be, I've gotten more and more vocal about it because I used to be pretty quiet about it. Um, I, I didn't particularly like some of the um, pro-life groups and the way they handled themselves. Uh, but in the uh, you know 20, 30 years later, 40 years later, uh, 
I guess they were right. Because I kept thinking, well, surely this is not a, not a, I mean, people don't really do this. Yeah, I mean, sure, some people do, but some people do everything. You know, I mean, there's always some people. But now we have statistics of the millions of children who have been killed through abortion. Not, not, oh, oh, but, but the mother's life is in danger. Yeah, in like 0.6%, you know, that's an issue that you have to deal with. Oh, but, but what if your 13-year-old daughter was raped in the park? Yeah, that's a point. Four percent issue that you're dealing with. But yeah, yeah, I agree. But I would like to, when I get into this discussion with people who are pro-choice, I say, let's not even, I will concede to you all the 13-year-old girls that got raped and all the mothers who are going to be killed if they have the baby. I'll concede that to you. I'm not, I don't even want to argue about that. I just want to argue about the 98% of people who are killing their children because it's not a convenient time to have a child. Okay. Right. Or, or yeah, or it's not a convenient child to have. Right. Yeah. Or the, the other thing is, is, is you have the IV, IVF, you know, no one's counting those as abortions. Okay. No one's counting the IVF, but they are. Because if you have frozen eggs that are fertilized, those eggs either have to be born or donated or something, but you can't just you destroy them. That's an abortion. Uh, let's see. I think a lot of physicians who are pro-abortion see those 1% of the mothers, particularly at the community hospital like U of L, and justify their beliefs that way. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree that, that that's probably true. I, don't, I do not ascribe um, motives to anybody. So I, I'm not saying that, that if you're a pro-choice person, you're a bad person. I'm sure you have good motives for being pro-choice. I simply am saying, look at the statistics. And, and before you confirm your choice, uh, think about it. You know, are you pro-choice if that means that 98% of the people who are killed are killed because they're inconvenient or fiscally not sound? I mean, if Danya and I had uh, waited to have children until we were fiscally sound, we would be new parents. Because <laughs> it just happened, like within the last couple of years, <laughs> we actually became fiscally sound. You know? Yeah. yeah. Really, seriously. I'm 58 years old. Uh, about 55 is where I finally got to the point where I said, oh, oh, look, I can breathe. I actually, look, there's money in the checkbook. <laughs> Whoever heard of that? You know, it's about 55, 54, 55, somewhere in there. But you can't, you know, what if we had aborted? Well, we didn't abort because we were adopted. But what if we, what, you know, Danya will tell you that she's forever grateful to, to our birth mothers, that they didn't kill Neil and Noah. Because they could have, both of them could have. They chose not to. Uh, there were some interesting stories behind that around trying to and uh, Neil's mother is a very, uh, very conscientious, committed Christian. And uh, she told, she didn't know what she was going to do when she got pregnant. She was very uh, concerned about how am I going to take care of this child? I don't have a job. I don't have, you know, I live with my parents. I blah, blah, blah. Uh, and she thought about it. And she told Danya uh, there were two different times in the course of her pregnancy where she had finally accumulated the money to, to get an abortion. And both times something happened, right, d d took the money. I mean, it was like one time the flat tire, one time this, one time, yeah. Uh, and she saw that as God. And we, of course, agree, yeah, that, uh, that it was God that intervened uh, to keep Neil alive until we, could, until we came into the picture. And then, then, uh, then she was like, she was very happy because then she, there was a plan. 
know, that Neil would be taken care of. And she has stayed in touch all these years. Uh, she still, you know, sends Neil messages on Facebook and things like that. And, uh, she has pictures of him and, you know, all that kind of... Noah's birth mother has not been quite as involved, but she also did not abort him, for which we are very thankful. All it right. It doesn't matter either. No matter how much money you have, it's never enough. Right. Well, and then I always had the hope that eventually all of the financial responsibilities for children would end, and and now you have dashed my hopes because, yeah, you know... <laughs> Because you're 12 years ahead of me, and it hadn't stopped for you. So I mean, I've just given up now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's just a complete loss. It's a complete loss. All right, so that uh, gets us through uh, the, all the his, historical issues that lead us up to Hosea's prophecy. Uh, and we're actually going to pick up on talking about Hosea next week. Oh, no, not next week, in two weeks. Uh, next week, I'm not here. Uh, I'm doing sermon prep. Uh, next week. And so in two weeks, uh, we will meet again and uh, we will pick up uh, the, the, the in beginning of Hosea and Hosea chapters at least one. And we'll probably get through, yeah, we'll probably get through two and three too, that whole opening section to Hosea. Let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. All right, ending live video.